Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're going to continue on in Unit 4, discussing political organizations of space. Now in the last couple of videos, what we're looking at is the growth of the idea, or the kind of the development of the idea of the nation state and uh, larger political entities and, uh, and how they relate to each other and how they uh, developed and grew around the world, at least how they spread around the world. And so the topic of conversation today dovetails really nicely into that. Uh, because what we're looking at is global geopolitics and the only way that global geopolitics really comes around is through the development of uh, the globalized world that we live in. Instant communication, um, uh, com uh, continuous economic interaction uh, between countries and so uh, geopolitics is very much going to become a part of the globalized world that we live in. Now, geopolitics uh, revolves around the idea of, of alliances and, and states interacting with each other and competing with each other. And so that's been happening for a long time. But, but of course, the world that we live in is a much different world today, and, and states are able to uh, extend their reach much more extensively. Uh, states can do a lot more damage today. Uh, and there, and there's, there might be a lot, I don't know if we want to say you know, the, the actions between states might be a lot more subtle or can be a lot more subtle but can be a lot more uh, detrimental. So when we talk about uh, global geopolitics, really what we're looking at is it's, a, it's our way or our attempt to understand the global political world that we live in. Again, uh, discuss uh, looking at those uh, entities of states as how they interact with, uh, with each other. And we look at the, the global political world from a geographic perspective, meaning we're not just looking at uh, the states and the politics and the politicians and how they interact with each other, but really looking at it uh, from a geographic position and looking at the states and where they're at, um, what their goals and ambitions are based upon their geographic location, and trying to do things like predict the future, uh, not necessarily in a, in a uh, fortune-telling kind of sense, but trying to reach out there to the future and say, you know, based upon certain ideas or theories of, of geopolitics, what can we anticipate about the future? And if we can anticipate certain things about the future, what can we do in order to either prevent certain instances from occurring or better prepare ourselves for certain instances? Uh, and so really that's what we look at when we look at uh, geopolitics. Also, uh, we use geopolitics uh, to understand global events in terms of why things are happening. Uh, especially because a lot of the events that are occurring in our world today are not necessarily just uh, isolate, isolated incidents that uh, you know kind of occur in a vacuum, but they're events that occur because of uh, accumulation of events and accumulation of of aggravations and, and you know history and tension between people, uh, and so we try to uh, we try to understand uh, these events using geopolitics. And again, as I've said many times, is that it bothers us as humans if we can't organize and categorize and understand things. And so we, we use the uh, global geopolitics as a way to uh, kind of create an additional explanation for a lot of the events that happen in our world. And again, this next point, using environmental and territorial perspectives, it's not just looking at the politicians, but it's looking at the environment that they find themselves in, what are the territorial gains and goals that they might have for each other, um, how can we, when we look at the, um, when we look at the different events, uh, how can we use maybe the proximity of, of states to each other and the resources and things like that in order to understand the events that are going on? Uh, historically, there have really been two schools of thought when it comes to geopolitics. You have the German and the American, or the British school of, of geopolitical thought. And when we look at actually, when we actually look at a lot of uh, I guess geographers in general and ge geographic theorists, a lot of them are either Germans or Americans. It maybe has something to do with our uh, obsession with uh, trying to scientifically organize and categorize the world, and which is why we developed the uh, educational um, category of the social sciences. I won't get into that, my thoughts on that, but um, they, these are the two primary schools of thought. And one of the questions they try to answer, maybe that was poor formatting there, it should have maybe gone out. So one of the try one of the answer one of the questions they try to answer is you know why is it that states are powerful and then wh what is it that can make states become powerful and just like we were talking previously if we with the predicting future events if we understand why our states are powerful and how they can become powerful uh, states can use those theories in order to themselves become powerful and put themselves in a more advantageous uh, position when it comes to political uh, maneuverings and things along those lines. Just like 
uh, when we might have a mentor or somebody we really look up to and we look at uh, you know the things that they did in their life to become a better football player, uh, a wealthier investor, an entrepreneur, or whatever. Uh, same thing. We look at when we look at states and their desire to become powerful. You know, what do we do? We model our we model those states, or those states model themselves after those states that have been powerful. So I'll try to run through this relatively quickly. Um, the first one we're going to look at is what's called the German or the organic theory of geo, uh, global geopolitics. This was developed by uh, a German geographer by the name of Friedrich Ratzel. And basically his, his theory posits that states are just like a living organism. Uh, you know, states are made up of people. People are living organisms. Uh, and so states should act almost like living organisms. And so in order for states to survive and thrive, states need nourishment. And so, you know, what is nourishment? Nourishment is, uh, it is natural resources. It is people that are going to uh, run the economy and those types of things, and um, it's the food that's going to be produced for that particular state. And so if a state's population begins to grow, you know, what does the state need to do? Well, it needs to go out and it needs to overtake other states. Now, you'll notice the time period, 1940, uh, you know, right there in the World War II era, and, you, you know, we, we know what happened in Germany with Hitler and, and what he's doing. And so when you look at this theory, this idea that states uh, need this additional land and resources and you begin to understand a little bit more about why Hitler was so intent on you know, going out and conquering other territories, taking over land. It wasn't maybe necessarily just about taking over the world, but remember uh, Hitler had a goal for creating this um, you know, pure Aryan race and uh, eliminating all these other people groups from the world and so in order to kind of I guess fulfill that particular goal and ambition that he had not only did he have to eradicate other peoples, but then he had to take over land so that, uh, you know, in his mind, uh, the motherland or the fa sorry, the fatherland of Germany could uh, could then grow and, and uh, sustain itself into the future. The next area we're going to look at is uh, from the American or the British school of thought, and in fact, those are the next couple we'll look at, developed by uh, a British geographer by the name of Harlfer Mackinder. And the way that he looks at, at global geopolitics is that power is going to be land-based. Uh, and so when you consider that idea that, that if, we're look, if a state is looking to become powerful uh, and you need a land-based, uh, kind of almost a home base in order to become a powerful land, you begin to look at the world and, and what areas of the world have <clears throat> sorry, uh, you know, large amounts of territory and land and natural resources and those types of things. And so he points to this area that he calls the heartland uh, as, or at least that's what he considers to be the key uh, to almost global power. Uh, and so that's this area here, kind of central Eurasia that encompasses Eastern Europe, uh, as well as, as, well as um, pretty much all of Russia uh, and northern China. And so it's this area that he believes uh, is really the key to global domination and this belief that if any country is able to control all this territory uh, with its land resources, uh, with, its, uh, with, the, with the, um, the food that it can produce for its population, then that, uh, that country or that state would, be almost in, uh, would, be, would not be able to be defeated. It's almost like this land fortress uh, that it creates around itself. Now you have to notice the year 1904 and he's thinking about the military capabilities of the time. So obviously this is a, a period before uh, flight and before, or not so before flight, but before you know, uh, airplanes are used in warfare. Uh, and so uh, clearly today that wouldn't necessarily fly, but during his period it makes sense that you know, if you have this large uh, land base that's uh, very difficult to, to penetrate, uh, and it also provides large amounts of resources for your population, uh, then that would be very difficult, uh, very difficult to defeat. Now this is a little bit different from some of his contemporaries because during this period really naval power, naval domination uh, was seen as the key, not only because of your ability to control trade routes but also because of uh, your, obviously your naval power, you also have port cities which allow you to trade uh, as well. And so he, he runs a little bit contrary to uh, some of his contemporaries, does McKinder. Now Nicholas Spikeman develops what's called the Rimland Theory. Uh, in 1938. And so in his Rinland theory, Nicholas Spikeman, uh, he, he takes Mackinder's theory and he goes a little bit different route with it. And, and basically what he says is the heartland isn't necessarily as important. You know, he sees some of, the, some of the benefits of the heartland, but really 
he sees the Rimland is is more significant. Um, and if one wanted to, I guess, to control the world, if you had a, if you control both the Heartland and the Rimland, uh, then, then of course that state would uh, be able to dominate the world. And and then if I think that's kind of almost self-explanatory because then you're controlling, you know, what two continents. Um, but anyway, with all of its land resources and and those types of things. Uh, but and it's the Rimland, not necessarily just because, uh, not not just because of the amount of land and resources but also because it allows access to the sea and trade. Uh, and he believes this would allow the state to develop economically uh, much more quickly than the heartland. Um, obviously, if you know anything about uh, history in, in Russia, one of Russia's problems for, uh, for many years was the access to warm water ports, the ability to trade with other countries. And so, yeah, Russia is very well insulated. This heartland area is very well insulated. But trade and e economics becomes very difficult, which is why Nicholas Spikeman uh, thinks that the Rimland uh, is, is so significant. Now, and, and he uses that to explain the rise of industrial Japan and kind of its uh, prominence and importance uh, coming into World War II. It also helps you to understand uh, some of the, the positions of the United States uh, with containment uh, and also the wars in Vietnam and Korea. Uh, obviously, with the rise of the Soviet Union, uh, trying to extend out and extend its influences in place. I mean, China had already fallen to communism. Uh, Vietnam uh, was potentially, uh, well, I guess eventually did fall to communism. Uh, North, uh, the Korean Peninsula almost fell entirely to communism. And so that could have been part of the uh, American uh, incentive to try and fight in Vietnam and Korea is this whole idea of the Renland and uh, the desire to keep uh, the Soviet Union from expanding and keep uh, communism from expanding and that, that whole policy of containment. And that this whole concept of heartland rimland is, is almost central and, and key to understanding uh, some of the more modern statescraft uh, that we've seen in a post World War II world. Um, now, of course, with the fall of the Soviet Union, things change a little bit because you're not so much worried about uh, the spread of communism because it almost becomes a defunct ideology after uh, 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. The last type of uh, geopolitical theory we're going to look at is. Uh, was developed by a man by the name of Saul Cohen and he was writing in 2003 looking after the fall of the Soviet Union and so he's looking at a world uh, where no longer do you have this idea of just kind of the two colossal superpowers fighting against each other where you know during the Cold War you had the United States and the Soviet Union instead what we're looking at is a world that's going to be uh, primarily focused on economics and he sees the conflicts arising uh, in places that are both globally and, and uh, regionally important, uh, economically speaking. And he discusses the idea of shatter belts and gateways as the places of, of potential volatility. The gateways are these places that are kind of entry points into uh, some of the more uh, economically, uh, not necessarily developed, but um, uh, economically, uh, places with economic potential. Uh, especially looking at places like Eastern Europe and um, the, the gateway into uh, the heartland and the shatter belts of the places where you have some of those overlapping claims and, and weak control so they uh, create uh, almost uh, instant volatility. And so with these kind of weaker places that are shatter belts and gateways, uh, not only do you have um, the potential for greater conflict and as it arises in those regions, uh, then you have uh, the potential for greater global disruption spreading from the region in the, in the area that's out into the wider world, almost like what you had in, in World War I uh, with all the alliances and things along those lines. Uh, and so he uses that to kind of focus in on some particular areas. And so he looks at, uh, you know, he looks at places like Southwest Asia uh, with, uh, with um, the, the oil resources and things that they have uh, there and, of course, the potential uh, wider conflict that we can see come from that, which we've seen in the last, you know, uh, five to ten years or so. Uh, and some interesting things to kind of think about is that uh, with this idea of shatter belts and gateways, really your former uh, war and military strategy no longer applies because of the new types of weapons. Uh,